question of the week. I had a quarterback. Any attribute or trait, if any, you can say no, that you would maybe like to see Dak Prescott borrow from Cooper Rush? Wow. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I can't say that, but by the same token, if you were to ask me the same question in reverse, what would what should Cooper take from Dak? I, I couldn't couldn't probably answer that one either. I, I do think all these guys are individuals in the sense of how they play, how they their personality, how they react, um, all that kind of stuff. And the funny thing about quarterback is they they come in all different shapes, sizes, abilities of speed, arm strength, and they can all. You know, you can you can be effective in a variety of different ways. You know, you look at tackles, right? Nobody wants a tackle if they don't have 32-inch arms. Nobody wants a receiver that doesn't run under 4'6", and you prefer it under 4'5". Right. I mean, you have all these, but you, you just look at Kyler Murray, and then you look at, you know, you look at Dak, you look at Tom Brady. You know, I mean, you, you couldn't get two more dis- dissimilar quarterbacks than Tom Brady and Lamar Jackson, but you'd like both of them on your team, right, mm-hmm. I mean, to be your quarterback. So, again, there, there are so many ways to get it done. And we, we even saw Peyton Manning and Drew Brees, you know, t- at, at the end of their careers, they, they probably couldn't throw the ball 50 yards. I remember Drew Brees reading something that uh, he, he wanted to try to get the ball, be able to throw the ball 50 yards. Well, I, I can – I can pull a hundred high school kids here in DFW and they can throw the ball 50 yards, yeah. <laughs> but that, they can't be an NFL quarterback. So I, I guess the, my point is you can be effective in a variety of different ways, but to answer your question, do I say, okay, Dak has to take this from Cooper. I, I, I don't think so. How, how big do you think the drop off is between the two players? Well, there's a drop off. There's a reason why one's a starter and, and the other's your backup. And, uh, but I, again, can you win with Cooper Rush? Well, it's, it's been evident, right, that, that you can win with him. Now, to, in Cooper's case, so here's the thing that has helped him. We all know he's 2 and 0, right? Beat Minnesota, beat the team that was in the Super Bowl. You know, Minnesota scored 16 points, Cincinnati scored 17 points. Yeah. So he hasn't had to be in that game where I got to put 35 or 38 up, right? We, we see a lot of those games in the NFL. So that has really played to, to Cooper's strength, which is being smart. He's taking care of the football, all those things you know that we talk about. But the defense has allowed him to be that guy, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. That being said, both in Minnesota and against Cincinnati, he had to bring that team. Uh, Cincinnati, of course, was tied, but he had to bring that team down on a final drive to get the win. So that that's huge. How different is the play calling? When Cooper's in the game versus uh, versus Dak, I don't think a ton, and and especially now that Dak is no longer going to be a runner, you know, mm. they're they're never going to have have a designed run for Dak. They're never going to do, <laughs> you know, all, all the all the things that we used to see Dak do earlier. But after that leg injury, and hell, just you know, you don't want to get your quarterback hit, you don't want to get him hurt. So the best place to not have that happen is to keep him in the pocket. So in terms of play calling, I don't I don't think there's really been any difference to be quite honest um again i'll go back to the offensive line to me that's going to dictate your play calling as much as anything can we can we keep the pass rushers off the quarterback long enough to run some deeper routes and those deep overs that we had kind of talked about a couple of weeks ago and well it's great where you say hey if we take this guy if we take turpin out of the slot we put him slot right we run him 20 yards across the field on a deep over on those to the left hash we're going to hit this. It's like, well, that yeah, that's great, but you know, we're not going to be able, we're not be able to pass protect to allow him to do that. So that that plays as big a part to me in your play calling as anything. How have you felt about all these different DAC return timelines? Uh, it's, it, I don't want to say it's comical, but I, I really don't pay attention to it, Brad. You know, you know, Brad and I have, like to have our little fun together. Yeah, and, and it really is good natured, you know. So last week. Brad, it was like, uh, so Wednesday was the Wednesday practice, you know, kind of the first practice of the week, if you will. And Brad says, okay, who, when you, I looked at this, who do you, who are going to be the seven inactives for Sunday? And I, I was like, who cares, Brad, we're going to show up at the game 90 minutes before the game starts. They're going to tell us who the inactives are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so with Dak, you know, all the, all the timelines and 
the conjecture, and there's only going to be one person that knows, and that's Dak. But I'll say this. You, you guys will be able to go out. I'll be able to go out. We can all go out and watch practice. Ball is either going to spin out of his hand or it's not. So that's going to tell us, is he ready to play? From what I understand, he can't injure the thumb any more than what's been done with the screw that's in there and all that stuff. It's just going to be a question of can he grip the football. And, again, Dak's the only one. We're going to watch him. If he can't spin it, he doesn't play. If he can spin it, Dak, you're our guy. So I don't get caught up in the timeline, I guess, is the bottom line. I'm gonna go, we're going to go out to practice. We'll be out there today. He won't be throwing today, but we'll, we'll watch him. And, again, anybody will be able to see, hey, okay, yeah, he can, he can throw it. Or, you know what, <laughs> that ball was just wobbling all over the place, and, and he won't play. Babe Laufenberg here on 105.3 The Fan. Uh, what have you noticed from studying the Giants for Monday night? Well, you know, the 2 no, as we all know, and for the first time in a long time, uh, and I heard you guys talking a little bit earlier. You watched Philadelphia, right, uh, on Monday night, and you just said, okay, ooh, that, that, they look pretty good. Yeah. Jalen Hurts looks pretty good. You don't watch the Giants and say, oh, wow, they're back. <laughs> right. You know, they've had two close wins against two, I think, what will be very average teams by the end of the year if they're not average already. So they've been the benefactor of that. They haven't had to do a whole lot to – to beat, you know, the other team, if you will. Uh, Daniel Jones has been kind of efficient. There's a reason why the Giants didn't pick up his fifth-year option this year. Um, I, I think he's always a threat from the from the running standpoint. You know, he is such a good runner, and that's a big part of Daniel Jones' game. You know, he's completing 71% of his passes. They're, they're throwing a lot of – I don't want to call them safe passes because anytime the ball is in the air, <laughs> bad things could happen, as Woody Hayes once told us. Uh, you know, you throw the ball, two or three things that are going to happen are bad, right? <laughs> but he's he's been solid. But, again, you, you need a much bigger body of work on Daniel Jones to say, okay, boy, he's arrived. <laughs> what adjectives have you been using lately or have you run out to describe Micah Parsons? <laughs> you, no, you're, you're exactly right because – you, you do. Brad has a better vocabulary than me, and I'll bet you even he's out of it. <laughs> you know, it, it, what's funny is, and I asked Dan Quinn th- this question what, Monday when the, we coordinators were available, but, uh, you know, you got a lot to do. As, as that guy, he's up in the booth, you're calling the defense signals, you you got so much going on, and you're getting input from other coaches. And, but I said, do you ever sneak a peek at Micah and say, okay, I, I just kind of want to watch this guy. And, and I find myself doing the same thing. And I'll sit there and break the huddle. Now, Micah played exclusively at defensive end. He was a defensive end this past week. Um, Finally, I, buddy. I find, uh, <laughs> a, well, and very quickly. Can you I refer to him as out. Coach Choppy, Coach Choppy from now on? Yeah, that's right. I love, yeah, I, I refer to him whatever he wants me to. Oh. Okay. Usually I just call him Sir or Mr. That's what he prefers. <laughs> Lord. But, I prefer Lord. <laughs> but. I think Anthony Barr being in there, you know, they play that 4-2, you know, with Micah being a, a defensive end, if you will, and he's part of that four, and you've got two big, rangy linebackers. But Anthony Barr, you know, one thing you kind of don't appreciate maybe as a fan or whatnot is, you know, Anthony Barr is 6'4", 6'5", and rangy and arms. And, you know, you try to throw the ball over him in seams and things like that. It's not an inviting target. Hmm. So both he and Leighton, can can run with people, you know. They if they go Tampa two, which they did a couple times, those guys both have the capabilities of, you know, running down the field with wide receivers. Now they won't go stride for stride, but again, just picture you're trying to throw the ball over a guy six five to a receiver that could be five ten six feet. It, it's a it's not an inviting proposition with those two. But uh, yeah, Mike has just been to get to your point. You know, I always say good great defenses have that one guy where you when you break the huddle offensively. You always got to account for mm-hmm. whoever it is, right? You you broke the huddle against the Giants back in the day. Where's Lawrence Taylor? I think with DeMarcus Ware, there was a little bit of that. I don't know that I've seen a guy, especially because they move him around so much, not so much in this last game, like Micah, um, where, where teams have to account for him, but it's hard to account for him when he's a moving target, you know? I mean, T.J. Watt sits over there, great, great, great player, <laughs> but – he sits over there. He's going to be on the right side of your offense every snap, right, for the most part. But with Micah, 
it, it's hard to set your pass protections to him because you don't know where he's going to be. Plus, there's also – I don't think there's a flaw in in his game. Like, if you, I think you have to look really hard for yeah. a flaw. So you can't – I don't even think – can you even pick on him on anything if you wanted to? I, I, don't, I don't think you can. Uh, to me, good against the run. Obviously, great pass rusher. Uh, I mean, bumping against calling him a great pass defender. I mean, he, he's great in pass defense. The only, the only thing I don't like – not I don't like, but I always say I, I can find guys to go drop in a zone, right? I can't find guys to go get the quarterback. Yeah. So I always like to see Micah moving forward and not backward in terms of once the ball is snapped. But uh, no, I mean he and for as young as he is, and you know, obviously opting out his senior year, or junior year, I guess if you will, at at Penn State, being off football for a year, and he's just, yeah, I think you, you do. You run out of adjectives to describe just how good he is and how good he's been, and. I mean, you sit there and you say, well, two sacks in the first game, two sacks in the second. Okay, multiply that by 17 games, 34 sacks. Well, nobody's out of – but if you told me he's going to have 34 sacks, <laughs> I would say, you know, I could – I'll I, take it. I could maybe see that. Could maybe I could see, see to that. a game. Exactly. Uh, which is crazy, and it won't happen, but I, I, I couldn't totally dispel it, you know. Yeah. 